Welcome to the Spirit of Truth video podcast. Today joining us is Paula Thompson. We're going to talk about her long journey with the Urantia book and our shared love for the teachings of Jesus. So stick around, it's going to be a good one. So joining us today is my good friend, Paula Thompson. Thank you, Paula, for joining us. It's so awesome we could finally do this. It's <laughs> awesome to have you here. Thank it's you. It's awesome to be here. You've done a great job. I'm so delighted to see your studio and bravo. Thank Kudos. you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, it's not like I did it all. It was a lot of help from you and others, but especially, you know, a lot of support from you. So yeah, well, thank you. It's my pleasure. <laughs> yeah. To help you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I consider it an honor and privilege. And I consider you one of my best friends. Yay. So, so yeah, me too. A, <laughs> awesome. So it's a blessing to have you here. Oh, we'll spare great. the audience all the cheesy love that we have for each other. <laughs> <laughs> that isn't that cheesy. It's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's, I think maybe we could start with that, that our friendship is kind of bridging a gap of generations. Mm -hmm. But yet there's a mutual affection for one another of shared truth and experience and, you know, just religious experience in particular. What's your experience with that relationship? Well, you remind me of my kids. So it's really <laughs> easy for me to get along with you. I always loved your generation and I love your generation's music and I love the way you guys think and, you know, I get you. And so it, it's not a stretch for me at all. In fact, I really enjoy working with you. You bring such great young energy Thank to you. the fellowship office. And uh, I love your humor. <laughs> you know, it's really fun to laugh. Yeah. I'm, I'm a person who all my career, I've, I've liked to interact and, and with the people that I work with. And so it's really important to have fun at work and that work should be enjoyable and fun, I think. It so is. you make it so, and I appreciate that very much. Well, thank you. And, you know, you created the foundation for me to feel at home. Yeah. And so I, I appreciate that. It's not that I make it, but you, you made it. Yeah. And maybe we could riff on that a little bit. We talked sure. about your long journey with the Urantia mm -hmm. book. Um, how long have you been involved with the Urantia book a movement or, or sharing the teachings in the book? Well, I found the book uh, in 1976, January of 1976. Wow. And um, I started reading it on my own uh, because it came into my life as a result of a sincere, very heartfelt prayer for the good news. Mm. Uh, I kept hearing the still small voice tell me, you have to find the good news. And I had just lost my dad. And so mm. that was the worst thing that ever happened to me in terms of it's the first major loss that I ever felt uh, of a loved one. And I sure wasn't ready. I was 20. And so I kept praying for it, and, and it ended up in my hands. And I read it for two years by myself, uh, tried to share it. I was so excited to share it with everybody, you know. And like most Urantia book readers, I got slapped down by everybody really? <laughs> that, yeah. that I tried to share it with. You know, you don't really believe that. Oh, this book that claims to be written by angels and other celestial beings. Come on. Yeah. That's just a bunch of, you know, malarkey. And you don't really believe that, do you? And, you know, and, and it was like, no, you just have to try it. You have to read it. Yeah. You know, I can't describe it to you, but it's, you know, it's making such a difference in my life and I can't help but want to share it. But, you know, there just was no reception there uh, from the people that I met. In your circles. And knew, yeah, my warm market, you know, which you would call your warm market, your brother, sister's mother, you know, friends, close friends, all of that. They're, they're the people that are already love you and might be interested in what you have to say, but none of them were at all interested, yeah. which I know I've talked to enough of Rancho book readers to know that that is not uncommon. Oh, yeah. And a lot of good, great relationships get ruined because of the Rancho book uh, between parent and child and siblings and, and spouses. That never happened to me. So I'm grateful for that. Yeah. But I but I came to a point where I just could not um, read it by myself anymore. And I was just bursting to talk to somebody else who believed it like I do. Yeah, it seems that it's kind of common that when someone finds something that kind of changes them 
and gives them hope or it's something healthy or good, life-giving, that they share it with their loved ones first, right? The immediate family, like, you know, I, I can't tell you how many uh, vegetarian friends who have gotten health from living a vegetarian lifestyle that immediately want to share it with me because they want me to be healthy as well too, sure. nonetheless. So it's kind of the same with that whatever spiritually works for us. But then when it's something that has a certain claim, right? Like the Arantia book has a certain claim, right? Mm -hmm. Where that it's written by divine mm -hmm. personalities. And then there, therein lies the challenge. But it seems like you kind of took the outreach full load and you really spearheaded a lot of outreach in the movement of uh, the Arantia book community. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe talk about the beginning of what outreach is and why and what it looked like? Well, yeah, because for me, you know, um, I took it, it was such a affirmation of my faith because I did pray so fervently. And what I kept thinking of uh, when the uh, when I had the Arantia book in my hands and when I started to read it and when it started to open me up um, spiritually and answer you know, all of the questions I had about God, about Jesus, about angels, about the universe, about inhabited worlds. I mean, I was a person who gave a lot of thought to these things all of my life. It wasn't like something like, oh, there are inhabited worlds. No, I first started contemplating inhabited worlds when I was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the answers that I were getting were so plausible and everything just made so much sense. And it was like a giant puzzle that came together and it meant so much to me. And, you know, I want to touch on the fact that you said, you know, it's natural for us to want to share good things with each other. Well, yeah, that's true. And it's one of the best traits in humanity, if you ask me. You know, they, they like to say that misery loves company, and that's true, too. But what I have found more often is that joy craves fellowship. Mm. And so when you find something that that means a lot to you, that you get a lot out of, whether it be a good book or a great movie or a speaker or a friend or a class in school, it doesn't matter the, what, what you eat, the places you shop, that you find what you need, that always give you great service. It doesn't matter what it is. If it's helpful to you, you want to share it with others. And that's a good thing. And so that, you know, the fact that the Urantia book pulled me back from a precipice of despair, which it did. When my dad died, I was despairing mm. in a in the most sincere sense. And it pulled me back from that. I, I honestly felt like my heart was dying. And as I read it, my heart came back to life. Mm. And so the affirmation of Jesus' teaching, seek and you will find, ask and you will be answered. Knock, and the door will be open to you. And I fully experienced the affirmation of those promises. Mm. I sought, and I found. I asked, and was answered. I knocked, and the door opened in ways that I could never imagine possible. Mm. And so that burns in me to this day. That m one thing burns in me. And so that launched my desire to do outreach. If this book could make such a difference for me at that point in my life, imagine what it could do for anybody, everybody, if they'd give it a chance. Right. And so yeah. I became more invested in helping whoever I could than in helping everybody. You know, everybody's got to read this. No, I think I figured out early on that everybody wasn't going to read it, but that didn't matter. And so when my wonderful local community, which you are a part of now, and you know these people, and you know how wonderful they are, and we're all very sincere. Yeah. We are sincere students of this book. I mean, it's such a privilege to know these people, people like Andre and Joanne and Merritt. And, you know, I could go on and on. John Hay, our dear, dear friend, Mo Siegel. I love them so much. And together we said, why not? You know, and, and really to tell you the story of how it happened, it was my dear associate, Joanne Wiedemann, whom I worked with for 10 years at the fellowship office side by side. I worked with her at Jesusonian before that. You know, she came to our meeting, our local meeting, and said, you know, one day I was at the People's Fair, which is a great, you know, uh, spring tradition in Denver, Colorado. And it started out with like 19 booths on the lawn of East High School. 
and it grew to be hundreds of booths and 300,000 people walking through there on any given day. And uh, she said, I was at the People's Fair. Well, it was brand new when she said this. It was in about 1982. And she said, um, that I, there's a booth there that was put on by the atheists. And it's just full of anti-God slogans and horrible <laughs> anti-God messages. And she said, they have a message, but we do too. If they can have a booth there at the People's Fair, why can't we? And all of us in the room said, yeah, <laughs> why can't we? And so the very next year, we pulled together all the resources with the help of people like Harry McMullen and Moe Siegel. What year was this? In 1983. 83. Okay. And we had our booth at the People's Fair. And, uh, and we had a booth at the People's Fair for probably 15 consecutive years after that. Wow. But that led to outreach in many different venues. Mo, Mo again, is an outreach guy, and he was like, yeah, we can do this. And seeing how well it worked, seeing people come up, asking questions about the Urantia book, what is it, who wrote it, how did it get here, you know, what does it say about this or that, you know. And you have to think on your feet to answer these sincere questions. These aren't, you know, these are people who are interested and they're seeking right. and they're curious what you have to say and what does this book have to say about this or the other thing. And so you have a chance while you're standing there to really hone your skills and be able to give them information that might be relevant to them. And my prayer has always been, as I undertake these adventures, uh, is to ask God and the angels to use me however they can. And oftentimes what I pray is, just use me to speak to your children and give them what they need, mm -hmm. something they can keep. Mm -hmm. They don't have to read the Urantia book. You know, and they may not, and that's okay. But yeah. please help me to give them something they can keep. Well, let me put you on the spot because from your skill development of working at Booths and doing your ranch book outreach, outreach, maybe people come up with you up to you and ask you a question, something like this. And let me ask you this question: What does the Rancher book say about um, a female god or female divinity? What, what do you get that question? Not and what per would you say? say exactly? You know, I'm, I'm, I mean, I haven't yet, but really? um, I have given and in any potential question, I give a lot of thought to. You know, it's interesting. You go to do outreach, and people ask you thought provoking questions. That makes you think about other potential questions or how you might answer that if that comes up. And and uh, I have been questioned about why is the book so paternal and why does it speak in such paternal language? But, you know, at the Whole Life Expo, for instance, which I have exhibited at many, many times, and I've hung out with New Agers a lot, they do believe in the feminine deity. And actually, I like that question because if God is everywhere present, if God is omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, then God is everything. God is male and female. God is, you know, all things and beings, which of course is a Urantia book teaching, as we know, and it establishes it early on, the first great source and center of all things and beings. And, you know, it's important to contemplate that. Jesus himself said, you know, in the kingdom of heaven, there is no male or female, free or bond, rich or poor, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And so what he's saying is it's, it's equal. There is equality in this realest, most sincere sense. All are the children of God. God is the great first source and center. Yeah, you have yeah. a you have a challenge there when you're at the booth. I know what it's like being at booths because you might give an answer like that, and then it opens up a whole another that's what you ho want? hole. <laughs> and so then someone would say like, "Oh, well, that's a nice teaching from Jesus, but there were no women apostles, you know. So what about? I mean, why would I want to listen to that? It's the same patriarchal system that we're in well, now. You think there were no women apostles, but you would be wrong. See, that's there what I'm were. saying. It's a whole nother hall. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's what's so interesting. You know, so many times you'll be talking and oftentimes when you meet, especially other Christians, because they love to challenge you. Mm. 
They love to challenge anything that would claim to be an authority about Jesus or God. And so if you are claiming that, then they're going to challenge you. Of course they are, and you have to be ready for that. You know, and I'll just give you an example of, you know, I could go on a lot about booth stories because booth stories abound, uh, especially when you've worked at a Urantia outreach booth as much as I have. But um, we were at the Denver, Pe not the People's Fair, but the Whole Life Expo was in town. And the Whole Life Expo is a wonderful group, and they promoted a lot of New Age Expos all over the country. And uh, actually, 9-11 was their death knell because... Uh, they were planning a an expo in Boston two weeks before 9-11. Oh, bummer. Or two weeks after, I'm sorry. Their expo was two weeks after. All the flights were canceled. All of their main speakers refused to show up. And so that was it. They had gone way out on a limb. They were they had gone too far to get back any money, and that was the end of the whole life expo, which makes me very sad because they were very good at what they do. But we were in Denver at the uh, whole life expo, and um, every once in a while, you know, Christians didn't always come into the New Age Expos because you have to pay to get in. You you would see you would get you know more challenges uh, along those lines at the People's Fair because you don't have to pay to get in, right? But when people have to pay to get in, you know they're coming in to challenge these New Agers and how they think mm. that they're really committed to this challenge. And so there was about six of us at the booth and we were having a great time. We were talking to a lot of people and we were absolutely consumed by about six Christians who came up and engaged each one of us in a conversation. And they were very challenging, you know, and um, the, the fellow that I was talking to was very confident in himself. And um, he kept challenging me and challenging me and challenging me. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, you could almost write a script on what they say. It's of the devil. And, you know, right, right. Uh, you know, why would I believe this? You know, by what authority, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I said at one point, well, you know, Jesus said that we would know each other by our fruits. And I said, now what that means to me is that you have to get to know somebody. If you really want to know if they're kind and loving and loyal and honest and sincere, trustworthy, sympathetic, you have to know them. You have to see them in many different situations to discern those things. And I said, so you would have to get to know me to know if I possess the fruits of the Spirit. And I would have to get to know you. We can't establish that in a chance encounter at the Whole Life Expo. Does it kind of throw people like when they hear you quoting Jesus to teach well, a Christian yeah. about how to relate to Jesus? <laughs> well, after all of this conversation we had had, when I said that to him, he put his head back and he went, well, I know you are patient because I have thrown everything I can think of at you. Mm. And you have not gotten upset with me. And we both laughed. And the whole conversation changed at that point. All of a sudden, I wasn't an adversary. All of a sudden, I wasn't some whacked out weirdo with a new age teaching. I was a sister in Christ. And mm. I saw it in his eyes. Suddenly, you know, I, got, I broke through to this fellow man with the teachings of Jesus, right, right? right? And suddenly his whole demeanor changed and now we were talking as equals and we were laughing and sharing freely and there was this wonderful exchange going on between us. And at the end, we gave each other a big hug. Mm. So for me, that's like one of my great victories at the booth, yeah. you know, and there's there's been so many of them like that. Uh, but there's some that really stand out. And that's one of them where, you know, I was able to win him over by being patient mm. and by utilizing the teachings of Jesus, whom we obviously both love. Yeah, you know? yeah. You you utilized the teachings of Jesus and brought forth the fruits of the spirit in relationship. Right. And so he was, you know, and, and you say, you asked me if, uh, if that shocks them sometimes. One time when I was in Boston, um, 
and I do it, I oftentimes would, would schedule a lecture because the Whole Life Expo would offer a lecture with every booth and all you had to do was show up and be ready and they would put you in their um, program and they would give you a time slot and you had 45 minutes yeah, yeah, to I've introduce done, you Rancher Book. I've done those. <laughs> 45 minutes is not a lot of time, no. but you know, you have to rise to the challenge yeah. and you have to touch on certain concepts in the book that you think this particular audience would be very interested in. And so that's what I did. And I got fairly good at it while well, I was in Boston and it was a full audience. And, um, and I was doing my, um, introduction and there were a couple of guys at the back after I was done doing the introduction, I said, I le left a little time for questions. And I'm looking at the audience, right? And the guys in the back, he holds up this, he holds up the Urantia book and he says, it says in the Urantia book, and then he reads from the book, right? And he puts it down and then he picks up another book, <laughs> which happened to be the Bible. Hmm. But the Bible says, and from my perspective, it was really interesting to see the body language in the room hmm. because everybody in their room kind of went, Oh, here it comes. <laughs> you know, they had heard it all before and they have been, you know, chastised, duly chastised by some dedicated religionist who just wanted to keep them from, you know, to, to save them. Mm, right? right. But they were, they winced. I could see the whole audience almost at with a minute he said, but the Bible says they all kind of, went, oh. oh. And so I said, you know, I don't want to take up everybody's time. Uh, with this, with this kind of a question, because it would usurp the whole time, obviously. So why don't you meet me outside in the hall and we'll have a great conversation about what the Arantia book says versus what the Bible says. And they were down with that. They were fine with that. Okay. You know, so after the lecture, because we didn't have that much time, right? And I just, I knew what would happen. So after the lecture, we stepped out in the hall and we were at the end of a hall. So there was no place to go, and I was up against the wall. And it was a big guy and a little guy. And um, I found out that the little guy was um, a seminary teacher. Mm. He was the one that asked the question about the Bible, and the big guy was one of his students and clearly devoted to him. Mm. So, you know, I'm a student of, of human nature and I'm a student of body language and I read people. I, you know, I try to take in everything they're telling me, whether it's through their eyes or through their body language or what's coming out of their mouth. Right. right? So they kept challenging me and challenging me. And I kept saying, but didn't Jesus say? And, and everything I said was from the Bible as well. Right, right, right. And they'd be like, why are you quoting the Bible? <laughs> and I was trying to express to him, to them that the, the Urantia book and the Bible are really very much simpatico. It's not just some new age, um, hip Jesus <laughs> that, uh, you know, is completely different from what we've always had. It's what we've always had and the teachings that we always loved. And even more, mm -hmm. so much more. And uh, at one point, um, they kept challenging me, you know, and they weren't about to let me go. I, I was literally backed against the wall. And at one point, um, this smaller fellow uh, asked me a question. And and it was, it was fairly aggressive. And I said to him, I said, you know what? Oh, right before I said that, though, I prayed. Mm. And this is something I, I do as a matter of fact. Just in my heart, my soul, with the Father who is within me always, you know, and the promise of Jesus, fear not in that hour, fear not for the Father will speak through you and give you the words to say. I take him at that promise totally. And so I said to the Father within, I said, give me something. Give me something that will release me and them from this experience because it's really not serving any of us. Mm. And the, the the smaller fellow asked me a question. The very next thing I said, I think, was um, God, because it's not something I would have thought to say. I said to him, I said, you know, there must be six billion Bibles in the world. There's only 250,000 Urantia books. Why does it trouble you so much? 
Mm. You obviously paid to come in here, and you were ready to confront me with the Bible and the Urantia book in hand. Why does the Urantia book trouble you so much? Mm. And he could not answer that question. Mm. And he went into an internal process. I watched it happen. He was like, you know, and the more he struggled to think of an answer for that question, the more the big guy got very animated. Really? Yeah. And he was almost at one point jumping up and down. Oh, man. And finally, I said, look, this, this experience isn't serving any of us. You know, you guys aren't going to change my mind about the Arantia book. I believe this thing is real. I know it's real. It's real in my heart. It's real in my experience. I've spent all these years with it. I know it well, and I believe it. And you're not going to change my mind. It just isn't going to happen. So you might as well just let me go, you know? Yeah. And, and, and just cash in your chips now and let me go because you're, bark you're literally barking up the wrong tree. Yeah. So how did it end? And they just kind of parted, and I walked through. Oh. Through the two of them, and I walked on my way. And that's like this, the, what Jesus had to go through. That little guy just kind of stood there dumbfounded, and the big guy was like looking at him dumbfounded, you know, and I just thought, Phew. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm glad to be out of that because literally the experience wasn't serving either one of us. But And it's crazy how you can go from being a follower of Christ to then persecuting so heavily. You know, <laughs> it's so true. Yeah. And, and Jesus said in the Arantia book, he said, uh, strive not with those you would win for the kingdom. Mm. You know, only, only do that if, if, they're, if they attack you, essentially, is what he said. And I'm paraphrasing. Right. But then he added, then don't hesitate to stand in vigorous defense of the truth that has saved and sanctified you. Yeah. And so I will stand in vigorous defense if they attack me. Well, that's an interesting challenge for all followers of Jesus of like, you know, don't, don't compete with evil, right? right? But at the same time, stand in, you know, righteous defense of the truth. Right. Right. Yeah, you know, uh, I mean, it, it's an interesting and intriguing thought to, you know, at a point, what are you striving for? Mm -hmm. You know, I had another woman come up at the booth, and oftentimes the MO would be the same. The MO would be, okay, so what does it say about this? Okay, well, what does it say about that? Right. Huh, okay, well, right. what does it say about that? Well, you, you know, they'd keep going with that until they could find the one thing they could contend with. And you can imagine what those one things would be, right? right? Right, yeah. And then they would get all hung up on that one thing. It was just like totally hung up on that. Well, that's that's a deal breaker. You had me, but nah, mm. we can't go any farther with this because that I cannot accept. Sounds like they're buying a car. Yeah. No, no sunroof, forget it. Yeah, no sunroof, <laughs> no, you know. Okay. No power locks, forget it. Yeah. You know? So, uh, and she, it was that classic, you know, conversation where she got to the one thing that she could contend about and then she launched on that and it was just, you know, na 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 on and on and on and on. And finally, you know, I, I'm not interested in... <laughs> bickering back and forth. Well, and I'm not interested in convincing her that she needs to read the Urantia book. Not at all. Right. I'm not there to convince unbelievers but, or people who aren't seeking for truth. And they might think that you are as opposed to saying, I'm here to give the truth seekers the truth, right? right. Instead of because they're under the guise of thinking that they're here to save people. Right. And save you probably right. too. And so they think that she's probably doing that also. right? Yeah. And I understand her motivation is a good motivation. I don't doubt that at all. And um, I appreciate that. And oftentimes I'll say, you know, thank you for praying for me. 
believe me, I will pray for you as well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that you believe what you say as sincerely as I believe what I say, you know. But on this occasion, I said to her, you know, you seem like a person of great faith to me. And she kind of stood back and said, you know, I am. And the whole conversation changed after that. And we were really? just sharing love with each other because I acknowledged that she was a person of great faith. Hmm. And that's all it took, just one, you know, and that's a Jesusonian technique that I've learned from the Arantia book, right? To call out the best in somebody, hmm. to point out something that I perceive about them that's good. Yeah. And and it changes everything. Yeah, it's like leading with generosity. Yeah. Then one of the greatest examples of that, well, there's several, and in just like I love to share my stories, I love to share some of the stories I've heard over the years so many, many, many times <laughs> uh, from other readers who have invited God into the moment. That's what I call it, inviting him in, in that moment of conflict, in that moment of consternation or whatever it is, just invite him in, just make a little bit of space and he will come in yeah. and he'll help. That's what he does, right? And uh, Crystal and our good friend Crystal and Beak Larson tells a great story about uh, being she was a young woman, gorgeous young woman selling insurance out there in the, you know, and she used to love because she grew up in Africa. She was not afraid of anything. And she would go and not that Africa is uh, dangerous or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. But it's because Africa isn't dangerous. <laughs> you know, that's why she was unafraid. To go mm. anywhere mm -hmm. and, and, and meet with anybody. And so she would go into the poor neighborhoods and she would go into the taverns or something and sit down and sell these person, these persons insurance. And she would sell them insurance all day. And she was like one of their, she was 22 or something, one of the top salespeople in the nation. Wow. By doing these types of things. But she ha was having so much fun one day in this particular tavern in a poor part of town. And it got dark on her and she had parked, you know, several blocks away. And when she walked outside, it was pitch dark and she had to walk back to her car. And she crossed an alleyway full where, where there sat a motorcycle gang. Mm, lucky <laughs> a, her. A gang of motorcycle outlaws, I guess we would say. And back in those days, that's how they looked and that's what they seemed to be. And uh, you didn't see motorcycle outlaws and think, oh, I'm safe. They won't harm anybody, you know. Yeah, okay. And she was crossing the alley and she saw them all staring at her. And she in the moment prayed and said, God, please give me something to get myself out of this situation because she realized that she might be in a really bad situation here. So there was about, I don't know, more than 10 of them, I yeah, think. Yeah. And immediately, and then she'll tell you this, that she, she believes this was God, the answer to her prayer. She walked up to the leader. It was obviously the leader. He was sitting in front. And she said, boy, am I glad to see you. You can't believe it, but I foolishly went inside and I was doing my job in the, in the tavern down the street and lost track of time and it got dark and now I have to walk to my car by myself. Would you guys walk me to my car? Hmm. And she said they all just kind of melted like butter. Interesting. <laughs> and said, well, yeah, sure. We'd be happy to do that. And the whole group walked her to her car <laughs> to ensure cool. her safety all because she called out yeah what is good in them yeah you know yeah and they had something in there to begin with too i feel like absolutely because there's a to make that assumption right? yeah and there's that like shared experience that they all have felt of being an older brother or a friend yeah. of some sort you yeah. know what i mean she called out the the hero in them yeah and there's a hero in all of us there's a there's a good there's a soul and a fragment of God in all of us, as we know from studying the Arantia book. Yeah. And so you can call on that fragment because it's there, it's real. And rather than assuming the worst in your fellows, assume the best yeah. and give them a chance to show you that they're good yeah. and they will, you know, they'll rise to that occasion and that expectation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And at least have faith that they will. 
Yeah, yeah. right. And you don't want to presume on on you know that protection too much. I mean, you're not going to go to you know into danger just assuming that God is going to get you out of everything. You have to keep your wits about you, you know. Yeah. But everybody finds themselves in situations that are tenuous. I agree. And <laughs> I agree. They need to do something about that. So. Well, cool. So uh, maybe ch- switching topics just a little bit, you get a lot of opportunities to share the teachings of the Ranch Book and the teachings of Jesus in multiple platforms, I'd say, because mm-hmm. you've been on the radio podcast, Cosmic Citizen, for a while now. I've been privileged enough to be able to share that with you for a few years. But um, can you maybe talk a little bit about that type of outreach? Because it's not the same as being in a booth, but yet it's still outreach. And maybe can you maybe tell us a little bit about your experience of doing that, that form of medium outreach? Ironically, um, when I wrote to Urantia Foundation, the first time I wrote to Urantia Foundation, an idealistic 22-year-old, and I was looking for other readers. And I was also wanting to know why, uh, because I had been listening to the radio and this radio show came on and it was reading from the Bible. And I had been reading these magnificent words from the Urantia book for Mm. two years now. And I had read the Bible, but there was nothing that I could compare to the magnificence of the thought that went behind the words that I found in the Urantia book. And I felt that intellect, and I felt the love that went into it. And um, I just remember thinking, why isn't the Urantia book being read on the radio? It's so powerful. It's so beautiful. It's so true. Mm. And so I wrote that as well. Like, why aren't these shows being read? Uh, why aren't these these words being read on radio shows? Mm. And I got back kind of the party line. I got a letter back from Emma Christensen. And it was about, you know, go slow, mm. all of that. And... Um, Go slow, meaning don't share the teachings that yeah, quickly? Yeah, uh, word of mouth. Tell your friends. Well, I had already told all my friends. I had already burned through my warm market, <laughs> completely burned through my warm market in two years. There was no <laughs> one left to tell right. in that market, you know. And still thinking, mindful of the seeker out there like myself who was looking for this truth, who was longing for it. And wanted to hear it. And, you know, I have a simple philosophy, and that is if it, if it resonated with me, then it will likely resonate with others like me who are similar, who are searching. Why wouldn't it? Sure. You know, if I could come to these conclusions about, you know, what I believed about God and Jesus and the universe— and to have the Urantia book affirm to me that what I believed about a loving God, a perfect God, a non, uh, you know, a fatherly God, let's say, you know, where God the Father transcends God the judge. Mm-hmm. It's not that judgment isn't there or necessary. It's that God the Father transcends God the judge. If I could read these words that rang a truth gong in my soul, there were others that did, you know, would would experience that too, and so I really felt like we, you know, there has to be some form of outreach going on with this. What's happening? And I got that letter back, and in all honesty, it kind of felt like a wet blanket mm. on me as an idealistic twenty-two-year-old. Like right. you know, I felt like a real heel for even thinking it, and yet. As I processed that, I became more and more convinced there's really nothing in the book that tells you you shouldn't share it. In fact, the book says things like, uh, we don't consider you even having possessed yourself of truth until you show your willingness to share it. Right. You know? And so everything that I ever read in that book, knowledge is only safeguarded by sharing, right? Right led me to believe that, you know, no, we need to be out telling people that this thing is here. There's a revelation on this planet, and you may not believe it, and that's fine, but I believe it. Mm 
And I would highly recommend to you that you look into it. Yeah. You know, like my good friend Steve McIntosh told me once, if you knew about it and didn't tell me, I'd be really upset. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it's true. What if nobody had bothered to tell me about it? I always think about that. I guess it's how you tell somebody about it, though. It you is. Know. and you. But, but the only way to hone those skills is to do it. Yeah. You'll never get good at it if you don't do it. Well, can you imagine Jesus' original apostles having yeah. to like get good at telling people about somebody who passed away? You know? Imagine them having to tell people about somebody who was still living. Yeah, yeah, I know that he grew up in, the, in Nazareth. He was, you know, you knew him as a boy and a young man, and you knew his brothers and sisters, and you knew his mother and father, and you know all about him, right? He went to the same synagogue schools as you and the same synagogue as you. I know, I know. You, you know this man is a man. But if you listen to what he says, surely you will hear the words of God. You know, yeah. if you just listen to him, surely you will know that he's not just a man. He's more than a man. But first you have to listen. And it's the same with the Urantia book. First you have to read it and decide for yourself if you believe what it claims to be. Yeah, you know? Yeah. And uh, you have to give it a chance. So. And then to take it to that level of evangelism, you know, whether it's for Jesus or for whether it's for a vegan lifestyle, you know, learning how to have tact you know, you can't just wear a sign and be a sign spinner on the corner of a street. Maybe you can, but is it effective? Is that effective outreach? Yeah. So. Some may think it is. Sure, sure. <laughs> you know, and if that's what they feel, if that's the most they can do and they feel like they're doing something worthwhile to promote, you know, an awareness of a revelation, then okay, I'm okay with that. You know, if they're doing what they feel like they can, if they stand behind the scenes and help, uh, if they if they contribute money to an organization like the Urantia Book Fellowship so that I can go out to an expo and do what I do, mm -hmm. because I'm an orator, right? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a, an extrovert. I love to talk to people. I love to engage with people. That floats my boat. But I don't imagine that everybody's like me. No, no. I know they're not. And that's okay, too. They can play a part, whatever part they want to play, even if it is to just study that book fervently with all their heart and then go out and live the teachings. I think, first and foremost, all of us need to do that. Mm -hmm. All of us need to live the teachings, whether we ever meet another person who reads this book, whether we ever tell another person about it. That's secondary to actually being kind and loving and being a worthwhile representative of, of the father and his son that have, have loved and fellowshiped all of us. Yeah, that's good advice because I, I think there's a lot of your Rancho book readers out there and maybe they'll watch this video, but they're not affiliated with any organization or maybe they don't want to be. But nonetheless, you know, isolation sucks. You know? <laughs> so I think it's nice to like send positive words of encouragement that, you know, you're not alone and that... This world is effectively progressing and the teachings of Jesus are going to rule the day, so to speak, eventually, you know? Yeah, it's a promise. He made that promise. And if you can't believe that promise, then what promise can you believe? Yeah. And so, you know, what, what would someone like you, who's the director of the Ranch Book Fellowship, like say to people who are out there who are isolated, who are isolated readers, you know, that they don't know that there's other people reading, like maybe like you were when you were a 22 year old? You know, everybody reacts differently to the book, and not everyone craves to socialize around it. In fact, very few do. If you looked at how many books are out there in print uh, in all languages, probably over a million now, and you consider how many people have listened to the audio papers that are av readily available everywhere online, I mean, you can find that you can easily find the Urantia book. So the vast majority of people are not seeking to socialize around this book. The vast majority of people are incorporating it into their lives and what they do. And they understand that, they understand its power. 
Mm. And maybe they understand, you know, wherever they are, in whatever realm they're in, maybe they're a Muslim living in a fundamental Muslim country. Maybe they're a Christian living in the Bible Belt. They don't want it to wreck their relationships. They can't afford to have that happen. Or they don't want to be targeted because of it. And persecutions can still be pretty p- severe on this planet yeah. in places, depending on where you are. You know, so they quietly read it and they do what, you know, and they live the teachings and it gives them peace. And and maybe they have to be really, really careful about who they tell. Maybe they can never tell anybody. And I, I my heart goes out to them because I can only imagine, you know, how much they must long to reach out and talk to other people who have found this revelation yeah. and share some of the concepts as we commonly do every single day. Everybody who calls our office, you know, they're either asking about it. What does it say about this? What can you tell me? I just found this. Who wrote it? You know, they're asking those questions or they're saying, wow, I love this book. This book changed my life. And so it's a privilege for you and I to be able to hear all of that. But there are people in this world who find it somehow, some way, that can't ever tell anybody they're reading it. Yeah, yeah. It's always it's always an experience for me when I'll be at maybe some kind of Urantia gathering and there'll be one person there who's from one of those countries where you can get heavily persecuted and they don't want you to share their name or tell anyone that they're there. There's no Facebook tagging, there's nothing. Do they're like, I don't exist <laughs> as far as you're concerned. <laughs> and they might deny you if you did reach out to them in a public way. Yeah. They might say, I don't know you, you know, but they have to yeah. because it's just the nature of this book. It's like the little guy, the little seminary teacher who couldn't answer my question. I knew why the Urantia book troubled him so much. I knew exactly why, you know, it was no threat to him. In terms of the Bible, it was no threat to the Bible. The Bible, like I said, has six billion copies. Why does it threaten you? The reason he couldn't answer me was because there's something about that book that touched his soul and it, and it gripped him and that bothered him because it wasn't the Bible. Yeah. Because it's not the Quran. Because it's not you know, the traditional oracles but, but or you're, the traditional sources of religious information. And you're getting at really like how there's also practice practitioners of these specific religions who also read the Urantia book. Yes. You know? And they particularly have a lot to lose by admitting they read And not just that, but also just to introduce the ideology that, look, it's not one or the other. It's not like the Urantia book is a religion baked in like all the other old ones or like it even is a religion. It's It's... Attempting, yeah, it's information that's attempting to uplift the quality of thinking on this planet, really. That's what it's doing. Yeah. And that's what it does. And many people who have read it have gone on to write important books, a lot of important authors. Mm -hmm. I won't name them. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I won't because, mm-hmm. you know, because of what I we was, just talked about. <laughs> yeah. And and because oftentimes, as we know, if you are famous and you admit openly that you read it, that could hurt your ability to get its teachings out into the mainstream so that people can start to understand that maybe God isn't a stern monarch whose chief delight is to detect his subjects in wrongdoing and see that they are adequately punished. Yeah. Maybe that's not who God is. Yeah. That's the good news. And that's the news we want to get out to the world. Don't be afraid of God. God is not here to harm you. God is only here to help. And his son is only here to help. I love to tell Christians this. Did Jesus come here to save us from God or for God? It's a slight distinction, but it makes all the difference. And then what do you find? Then it's then what were we saved from? Ourselves. We're saved from our own natures, our tendencies to be cruel or unkind, or judgmental, or angry, or debased. You know, he saves us from ourselves. He saves us from our own tendencies to do things we know are right. 
you yeah, know, yeah. to take advantage of our fellows, yeah. to use them, abuse them, mistreat well, them. And that behavior still kind of keeps this um, environment where it's still believable that Jesus was sacrificed, right? Like, okay, he sacrificed himself so that we were saved. But to me, I was thinking about that on the way over here, and I was just kind of thinking, like, that's still short because it sh it's a shortcut. It's saying, like, I don't have to go through my spiritual development because Jesus already did it for me. But at the same time, being fully aware that Jesus did save us. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, in, through the ranch book, we learn about rebellion and planetary rebellion and why things are a little backwards over here. And mm -hmm. Jesus kind of put a squash to it, but it's going to take a long time for that to work out. Yeah, to work out. And to me, that's the salvation. Like he came down here and got to work you know, mm -hmm. and then showed us the way right. and that a saving way really. And that's the saving work that he did, not the fact that he was sacrificed. And so then we're basically in adhering to that philosophy. I feel like you're sacrificing your contribution, your potential contribution. That's a great point. And there's so much hinged on that, this idea that if Jesus was all that he claimed to be, then why did they crucify him? You know, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. this is the great, you know, theological question. And as you know, the Arrange book answers it repletely, beautifully, you know, satisfyingly. And, you know, it's hard to, in a nutshell, try to express all that the Urantia book says about Jesus and who he was and why he came here. But suffice to say, he came here to live a human life. And it was, it, he had two great purposes. One was to reveal God to man, and the other was to reveal man to God. So by coming, by descending, which the Arantia book says Jesus is a descending son. And it's just one of the great concepts of the Arantia book that we've never heard before on this planet, that there are beings that start at the center of creation, that start in the pr immediate presence of the universal father and the deities on paradise and descend through time and space. And in so doing, they become the ultimate way showers for all of us who start out on the edges of creation and ascend. So he is, as he said, I am the bridge between time and eternity. He is that. He made a revelation of God and the true nature of God to us. And in truth, it is a New Testament. That's why we call it a New Testament. Mm -hmm. The God of Jesus is not an angry God. Yeah. Jesus was not judgmental and cruel. Jesus did not come here to slap everybody around. He came here to show us that we are loved, the beloved children of an infinite God, and that if we accept that through faith, we are saved. We can enter as little children, which is what we are. We just need to understand that. And so, the, as you point out, the salvation of Jesus is real. Mm -hmm. Because as he said, I have overcome the world mm -hmm. and you can too. And what does that mean to you? Well, we have a lot to overcome around here, don't we? Yeah. I mean, it's just a constant challenge on this world to be kind and loving and tolerant and patient. Just driving over today. <laughs> Challenges me, <laughs> challenges those things in me, challenges my better nature not to get angry, not to get upset yeah. by being cut off or by somebody else's erratic behavior, which might suck me into an accident, which heaven forbid, that might cost me my life, yeah. you know, or the shootings, as you know, what I went through a couple of weeks ago when the shootings at Walmart happened. And for two days, I couldn't think about it without crying. Yeah. Because all I could think about is my precious child, May, who would get so excited uh, every when every school year came back up and we'd go out and go school shopping. For supplies. For supplies. Yeah. She'd get jazzed. Yeah. 
And that's all I could think about was here are these families doing something together that makes them happy and gives them joy. And now somebody else is going to come in and shoot them up because that person is not happy and has no joy. And in my heart of hearts, I would love to give him joy. I would. I would love for him to find the love of his fellow men somewhere in his heart. Yeah. That doing such a thing would be unthinkable to him. But that's not going to happen on this world. And, and Jesus is a great example of how that, how that hap- that injustice, that gross injustice happens. One day I was thinking, I was feeling sorry for myself because I had been so terribly misunderstood. Oh, okay. Doesn't that happen to all of us? I mean, you think, God. How can I? I have good intentions and I don't, you know, that's not what I was intending, but I was misunderstood, terribly misunderstood. And then I thought, well, you doofus, look at your master. Look at the, the, the being that you love so dearly, who is your hero in every way, shape or form, because he lived a perfect life on this world. He was perfectly loving, perfectly kind, perfectly understanding, sympathetic, you know, tolerant, patient. Look at him. And now look, he was also the most misunderstood. So maybe it's just a part of living this life. Yeah. And and he has overcome that. And so can we. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. I also, for some reason, makes me think about his teachings of something along the lines of, you know, you know sa- sacrifice your life for this gospel, you know, and you will have eternal life. Mm. And what that faith really means, it doesn't mean like, you know, just commit suicide and you're good. No. <laughs> but it means giving up these material I don't know what you call them, status symbols or, or whatever, for that to be your identity and for your saving grace is not in the material kingdom. Mm. While we live in it, this isn't all there is. And so there really has to have this appreciation and discernment of value of something that isn't always visible. But yet, you know, you brought up a lot of the, its fruits mm-hmm. that we can grow to discern and take value from. And so... um what a challenge that we have this material structure that is so beats on our material selves, our animalness, but then to forsake that almost mm. and go for uh, something that can only be achieved through faith. This like peace that comes with faith, you know, it's like beyond what you know, even the peace that passes understanding is yeah. what Jesus called it. Yeah. yeah. He said, you know, uh, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world? only to lose his own soul. And then he added, and what would a man give for eternal life? You know, if he really had faith that eternal life could be his, what would he give for that? Yeah. You know, he also said to your point, you know, if you would save your life, you will lose it. But if you will lay down your life for my sake or for the sake of this gospel, you'll pick it up. And that's faith. And, you know, years ago, my dear friend Ann Garner told me a story about her little child, Ashley. She was 12 years old at the time, and Ann was living in the Bible Belt, but always very courageously spoke for the Urantia book to many, many ministers and preachers. And one came over to visit her one day. And the book was sitting on her coffee table, and the, and Ashley was in the room, and and uh, the minister said, "So tell me, Ashley, do you read that book? Your mom says you read that book." And Ashley says, "Yeah, I do." And he said, "Well, what can you tell me about that book? What has that book done for you?" And Ashley said, "Well, now that I've read the Urantia book, I'm no longer afraid to die, but I'm no longer afraid to live either." Mm. And that's what faith does, right? Yeah. That's what faith gives you. Faith that, you know, like the UB says, and I, you know, your ranch book, UB, same thing. It says that it, you need to quickly uh, take on a point of view of eternal life. Just start thinking of yourself as an eternal being. How does that affect who you are right now in this minute? Yeah. If you know that everything you do has repercussions, 
in eternity. You know, that the people you meet in heaven were people that you met on earth. And did you lay up your treasures in heaven by being kind and good to them? Right. Or now do you have some wound that you've created in another soul that you have to mend going forward? You know, how does it affect your behavior? You transfer your, the seed of your identity from your material self to your soul self, your eternal self. And now who are you? A Love cosmic that. citizen, right. to bring it back to the right. original cosmic question, citizen. and we got all the way over <laughs> here. So how's that show going, Paula? <laughs> Is that what you asked? Because I kind of lost that along the way somewhere. Yes, the cosmic citizen. I was telling you that I wrote to your ranch at foundation to ask them. Right, right. And they said, no, we don't do that. So my dream, when my, my friend Andre Traversa first approached me about doing the Cosmic Citizen on Blog Talk Radio, which is an internet service, right, which allows us to broadcast all over the world. Which, by Not the way, just, is Saturday mornings, if you want to catch it live, Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. Mountain Time. Mountain Time, on yeah. Blog Talk Radio, so it's blogtalkradio.com slash cosmic, cosmic citizen. citizen. Two C's in the middle. Cosmic, cosmic citizen. citizen. And you can look it up. You could probably even just type in cosmic citizen and that would come up on mm -hmm. some level. But so my dream was then, yeah, I can now read the Arantia book on the air. And that, that's how it started was just reading the Arantia book on the air? No, no, no. G Andre wanted to interview guests. Okay. And uh, he, he wanted to interview guests from a spiritual perspective, but he has a definite political bent. Oh, okay. And so we had some amazing right wing guests on our show because that's who Andre is. He used to love to tell everybody I'm Andre Controversa. You know? <laughs> and so he would invite controversy and he loved that. And being a blind person listening to the radio and listening to people spar verbally, he told me it was like wwf oh, yeah him. it's like watching boxing <laughs> yeah he loved it and uh, but i you know wasn't so comfortable with it but andre left fairly early on and then uh we took it more in an interfaith direction mm. where we wanted to talk to people about their religious experience and uh, their interfaith you know experience we didn't want to find fault with anybody we just wanted to you know celebrate what we have in common spiritually with other people. And, and we also fill a lot of uh, shows with studies from the Urantia book. And we make it clear that's who we're, what we're about. Right. You know, yeah. we used to, you know, go out for guests like Brian McLaren. We've interviewed Brian McLaren and Phyllis Tickle and, uh, Carlton Pierce. And, uh, he's, he's a, the preacher of a mega church that lost half of his church when he confessed to the congregation that he did not believe there was a hell. Oh, wow. Yeah. Very interesting show. We interviewed, uh, people like, um, Dinesh D'Souza <laughs> and Pamela Geller. And, you know, we, we had a lot of different guests on talking about different things, mm. but we really took it in a direction of not being a political, not being political. Yeah. That's not what we want to do. And I appreciate that. Yeah. It was, and plus, I, I felt like the, maybe the time that I was on the show for a few years, it was more around your rancher book study, but I also mm -hmm. appreciate that because we got to showcase a lot of the contribution that the Arantia body has presented. By that, I mean a lot of academic work has been done by people. I mean, this show alone has had yeah. a, little, a few of them already on there. And so I'm thinking maybe you could comment to however you want to go with it is the development of secondary work and academic mm -hmm. contribution, you know, because you got to see is really your generation that really started going after the, something like that. Yeah, we really pioneered outreach in, in every way. And, you know, uh, kudos to my dear friend, Mo Siegel, who started the Jesusonian Foundation in about 1986. And the Jesusonian was specifically created for Urantia Book Outreach. And the hope and the dream was that we could develop better ways and better tools to do outreach. And we had a catalog called the Good Cheer Catalog. And we, you know, we had initially Clyde Bedell's Concordex and Dwayne Faw's Paramony. And actually, Dwayne Faw and Meredith Sprunger were both on the board of the Jesusonian Foundation at that time, this burgeoning new private foundation. 
And Meredith wrote all of our, who was a United Church of Christ minister and highly respected, Dr. Meredith Sprunger, wrote all of Jesus Sonian's brochures. Mm. And he and Mo and Duane all worked on the Life After Death magazine, which was to be the first of many magazines. It turned out to be the only one, but it's still, people ask for it all the time. I've had people who don't even read the Urantia book, who have lost children, tell me this little magazine helped me more than anything else. Mm. You know, mm. and they actually call to get it, to give it to somebody who's bereaved, mm -hmm. you know. And so, you know, literally the, the million or so words in the Urantia book could spawn a thousand secondary works. The sky's the limit. A million secondary works. Movies and plays and, you know, books. Lots and of art, too. When we, and art, as we see with our dear friend Gary Tong. So much beautiful art like is possible. And Steve, Steve Sawyer, Sawyer, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you you know, to, to have done the Good Cheer catalog and and see it build up over time and see people say, wow, you know, I could do it. So I, I have a work that I could offer in the catalog. Mm. And we went from having three products to having a hundred mm -hmm, yeah. secondary works just because it was available and we were making a vehicle for that to happen. And of course, the Jesus Sonian is behind truthbook.com, mm. which all started uh, in 1996 when I was searching for Jesus online. And I couldn't find Jesus. All I could find was Christianity and Christian churches. No offense to them. They were doing what they do. You know, they were promoting their congregations. And I appreciate that. But I was looking to see, I was looking to find Jesus and see what was available mm -hmm. regarding Jesus. And I couldn't find anything about Jesus. You mm -hmm. see, Jesus was secondary to the churches. Really? Oh, Yeah. And um, and I'm a fan of the internet. I have been since the moment it came on. And so I called Mo and I said, you know, I was looking for Jesus and I couldn't find Jesus. And Larry and I, Larry Watkins, would like to create a website that's just all about Jesus. We could have his parables in there. We can have his um, discourses. We can feature his discourses. We can feature uh, a gallery of Jesus art. Wow. And art, you know, inspired because of Jesus. Uh, we can have, you know, music and other things. Uh, and it's just all about Jesus. And that's what it's about. So that people searching for Jesus might have a chance of finding him. And Mo said, you know, well, yeah, you guys go ahead and do that. So we created, Larry and I created the first G uh, website all about Jesus called Jesusonian.org. And that morphed into truthbook.com. Which is still and, around. Which is still around. Yeah. And Truthbook is an amazing site. I get Truthbook quote of the day yeah. every day. Yeah. It's splendid. I highly yeah. recommend it if you haven't been there. People should sign up for quote of the day. It's inspiring uh, every day. Yeah, man. You, you're, you've been around for a lot of the contribution and the outreach. You know? Yeah. So thank, thanks for all that oh, work. I appreciate it. I saw it. David Cantor build the most amazing website for the Urantia Book Fellowship of of scholarship hmm. just years and years 60 years worth of urantia scholarship and the best thinkers in our movement and david who is as you know one of the great thinkers in our movement yeah uh, compiled that library a scholarly material and uh there again you know if you want to if you want a library of scholarship on the urantia book go to urantiabook.org it's an amazing site for that purpose, you know. Truthbook.com is an outreach site. Urantiabook.org has always more primarily served Urantia Book readers because that's what the Urantia Book Fellowship is about. But um, And now Urantia Book Network, right? <laughs> I know. Thank you, Derek, for that. You know, you had to beat some of us over the head, but I think we're just, <laughs> I think Not we're literally. <laughs> I think we're starting to figure it out. Yeah, yeah. You get ahead of this thing. Yeah. You let us tell our own story instead of having the critics who they're out there and they will tell our story for us if we don't tell it. Right. It's important for us to tell our own story. Amen. Yeah. So thank you. Thank for you. That. Well, you know, 
are there any words that you'd like to leave us with? Maybe some words of wisdom from your vast experience on this planet of fun? You know what I always think of uh, when thinking of that is the story of John the Apostle, whom everybody loves, right? All of the Christians in Christianity, all of the Urantia book readers, anybody who ever heard the story of John loves John. And we know that he was one of the sun, sons of sun, thunder and that he actually had his mother approach Jesus one time and because he, he and his brother wanted to sit, he and his brother James wanted to sit on the master's right and left hand. Right, the master right. went to rule, you know, and established his kingdom. Be careful and, what you wish for. Yeah, and the master said, <laughs> I don't think you want to drink that cup, you know, yeah. because he knew where this was headed. But John, you know, wrote, revelations from the Isle of Patmos, and he was fundamental, a true believer in the Master. And um, when he was an old, old man, they would bring him out on a chair into the congregation. And the one thing that he would say, and the only thing that he would say, is, my little children love one another. Mm. And so I say to all of us, you Rancher Book readers, in, in every crevice on this planet, that message of John is as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago. Yeah. My little children love one another. And for all of us. Yeah. For all of us. Well, thank you so much, Paul. It's been awesome having you here. I know it wasn't that long, but I know that you're going to come back. Or at least you're invited to come back. So yeah. please come back anytime. And okay. God bless Let you. And thank know. you so much. <laughs> you're welcome, Derek. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. It was a lot of work on your part, and I deeply appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, you guys, for watching the Spirit of Truth podcast. Hope you can... Subscribe and like the Ranch Book Network YouTube channel and stay tuned for more awesome programming with awesome people. God bless. Thanks again, Paula. Bye for now.